Yeah, these must be old text messages coming in saying you're waiting. Here. Yes, yes, they're old. Yeah. No, it's it's you've got your house bugged, so you can tell when you're being recorded. That's what it is. <laughs> <Right>. Surveillance. <laughs> Yours says live on YouTube, John. Look yes, at you. We are live on YouTube. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the University of South Florida's speaker series. I would like to introduce our dean, Dr. Patrick Morio. Uh, he's going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Morio. Thank you very much, Jihan. And thank you, Jihan and the M3 Center for broadcasting this for us today. We'll be doing that with several of our, of our presentations this semester in the Hospitality Speaker Series, uh, which in, a, in, a, in some instances will be combining with the M3 Speaker Series in future. Uh, it's, we're, we're lucky to have a lot of industry people who, who join us for this. It really is my pleasure to introduce John Horn today. Uh, for those of you watching, who uh, are from Sarasota, Manatee, you know who John is. He, he is the owner operator of Anna Maria Oyster Bar and the associated restaurants. He's got over 300 employees, 350, I think. Uh, he, he, he counts some days. And, uh, and it's really a landmark in Sarasota and Manatee. John is also uh, a member of the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association Gulf Coast chapter as am I, but he also is at the state level so he's, he's one of my bosses at the state level. John is on our board of advisors. And John was, uh, if you have any problems with me, uh, you can blame John. He's one of the people that, that uh, hired me uh, four and a half years ago. So, uh, and I'm very grateful for that, John. John and I have discussed today, and John is, you know, the reason we're having him on early in the semester is because on the November 3rd ballot, there's going to be a, uh, a question on the ballot about the minimum wage. And uh, so, you know, this always is, a, is an issue that bears discuss, discussion and needs discussion uh, between uh, businesses, particularly small businesses, and between consumers and employees. So I said to John, sure, why don't you come, John? And he certainly has graciously agreed to do that. Let's discuss this and we can discuss it. And John will certainly make his, his, uh, his reasoning apparent for why they would like to see this bill defeated and uh and then but but some of you uh, may have a different opinion and i think this is the time to air it that's what a university is all about so uh, i really appreciate your being here john and uh, john you let them know when you want questions if you want to make a presentation first and then do the questions however you want to do it so john i'm turning it over to you thanks so much pat and thanks to all of y'all for being on on the uh, show today. Uh, I think Pat calls all of his classes a show, right? When you're in the hospitality industry, you're always on show. That's one of the things I love about Disney and their philosophy is they consider all of their staff cast members and they tell them you're always on stage. And I think that's so important in the hospitality industry. We're always on stage because people are always looking to us to see what we're doing, how we're acting, how we're appearing, and, and how we're thinking. So it's, it's awesome to always feel like you're on the show. Um, so thanks for being here today. Um, one of the first questions I wanna ask is how many of y'all are registered to vote? Is everybody registered to vote? Also, I, and not just this issue, it, it should be the first thing you do when you turn 18 is register to vote. It's so important in our country, you know, it's a privilege to, to be able to vote. So the worst voter, in our country is what? An uneducated voter. And I think sometimes that's the biggest problem when people go to the polls, the, the ballot becomes so long and they haven't taken the time to read. And so it's, it's so important to, to study before you get to the box. Um, you get in your ballot, you either mail in or absentee or you early vote or you go on the day of the election, either one it is. Uh, it's eight weeks from today. And you should be able to walk into, if you vote on the day of, if you vote on November 3rd, you should be able to walk right into the ballot box and be done in about five minutes because you should study all of it. There's six amendments on the ballot. There are you know, local representatives, there's county commissioners, there's city elections, there's state elections. There's a, obviously a presidential election this year. Um, there's no Senate in Florida, but you should study every ballot measure that's gonna come on there. Um, and too many people don't. Too many people walk into the ballot and, okay, let me read these six amendments and they haven't even taken the time. Or there'll be a, should we retain this justice of the Florida Supreme Court? 
and you have no idea. So how do you vote? Yes, because I haven't heard anything bad about that person. It, you know, she may be a great judge or she may not be, or he may be horrible. But unless you study, you've got to. So it's important to look at everything. You know, get your sample ballots online and look and see who's running, what's up for a bit. So the only one I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm not going to try to convince you any other uh, election except Amendment 2. And um, we've had conversations with our guests. We've had conversations with our staff on Amendment 2. And for the most part, I'd say 90% of the people we've talked to, they're like, I have no idea what Amendment 2 is on the ballot this year. Anybody, any of y'all know what Amendment 2 or have y'all prepped yourselves today so you would know? Anybody know what Amendment 2 is? Pat does, right? Now, if you were to ask me the other five, I probably couldn't tell you exactly what they are. But Amendment 2 is on the ballot to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. So if you were to walk into the ballot box tomorrow, or if it were today, instead of eight weeks from today, and you got there and, and you read um, just the highlight of it, and you said it's to amendment to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, most people would say, yeah, that's a great idea. Everybody needs to make more money. You know, we need a livable wage. But unless you look at it from all points, and, and that sometimes is a problem with constitutional amendments. Uh, the wording is brief to get your attention. Uh, amendment two is 196 words. And with 196 words, this group that put it on the ballot wants to absolutely rewrite how we're gonna pay people across every industry in, the, in Florida, across the entire state. And so that's why we're fighting against it because we don't, we're, we're just afraid of the unintended consequences. So let's just talk about the unintended consequences of Amendment 2 on the hospitality industry, right? So as, as Pat said, I've got over 300 employees. And when we talked about minimum wage for years and years, I always thought, it doesn't affect me one iota. I don't have anybody on minimum wage. I mean, we don't start people at minimum wage. You can't, you couldn't get someone to work for you for minimum wage, right? The, the minimum wage that you pay, well, the starting wage you pay is a negotiated wage. And it's the free market establishes what you pay people. So currently the minimum wage is 856. If, if any of you guys would go and cook at a restaurant, clean at a restaurant, do anything at a restaurant for 856, let me know. Would anybody go and work and cook at a restaurant for 856 an hour? I hope not. I hope none of you will take a job for 856 an hour. I couldn't hire anyone at 856 an hour. So the, the market has already established what the starting wage is. So therein lies part of the problem. Should the wage for Miami be the same as Gadsden County, Florida? The wage in Bradenton is not the same. I've got four restaurants in Bradenton and I pay different in the kitchen at each of those restaurants. I pay more out on the island. Why? Supply and demand. That's, you know, Econ 101 is supply and demand. It's harder to get people to work there. There's more people looking for jobs. At University Town Center, when they opened that mall a few years ago and they opened all the restaurants, what happened? Supply and demand determine what they were paying people. So where people were paying $11, $12 for people to cook in their kitchens, the starting wage out there became $14, $15, $16 an hour because the demand went up for quality cooks and the supply stayed the same. So if you had a restaurant anywhere near there and you were paying your staff $12 an hour, which was $4 more than minimum wage, all of a sudden, they're going to go get a job. They're going to get offered a job at $14, $15, $16 an hour. Guess what? They're going to go work over there. So that's one of our premises is the market should establish what the minimum wage is. Here's an, another unforeseen consequence that just unintended, you know, this is not, where is your first job going to be? At our restaurants, we'll have three or four high school, and I hate to say kids, but you'll have high school kids, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. Their first job ever, ever is in the restaurant business, right? So I've got four people in the 17 to 20 year old range opening the door, greeting you, welcome to the Anna Maria Oyster Bar, how many in your party? If I'm paying $15 an hour, I can't afford to pay $60 an hour to have people at the front door. So 
there's, you know, the threat of automation, which you'll see. And, you know, I, we don't like throwing that threat around, but it's going to cause hours to shift drastically. Instead of me having three hosts or hostesses on the front door, I'm going to go down to two or one. I will use, I mean, we currently use the Yelp app for no wait. We're going to use that more. So it'll be a time where you'll, you'll go on your app. You'll see how long the wait is at the Oyster Bar. You'll see it's an hour. You'll put your name on it. You'll appear in an hour. You'll say, hi, my name, name's Sid. I'm on the way. And they're like, hey, Sid, your table for four is ready. You're at table 13. And you'll just go and find table 13. It'll be like going into a hotel. You'll go to the first floor. And here's a sign that says tables 10 through 20 are this way. And you'll see it yourself. So it's going to cause a loss in shifts, it's going to cause a loss in hours where people think, yeah, it's great. Let's just raise everybody $15 an hour. What happens when you raise people's, I mean, everybody to $15 an hour, your payroll is going to go up. The other thing they're saying is, well, it's gradual. It's, you know, it, it'll go to $10 an hour. Well, in a full service restaurant, like you're all familiar with, like mine, like any full service restaurant, 66% of the hours are tipped employees. And tipped employees are considered minimum wage because you pay a tipped wage. So currently you get $3.02 as a tip credit from the government. So right now it's $8.56. Servers are making $5.54, right? Already Florida is compensating for that minimum wage and it goes up every year. Georgia pays the federal tipped wage, which is $2.13. So Florida is already accounting for higher cost of living, et cetera. So we're already paying 554, which is double plus the 213 federal minimum wage, right? When the wage goes to $10 an hour, it's gonna go up a dollar fifty dollar fifty-four. So from 856 to ten dollars is a dollar fifty-four. Every one of my 66% hours will go up a dollar fifty-four. So just taking one of my restaurants just one of four. So this is a, an easy thing for, for it. Most restaurants are, are, are independent restaurants, right? So an independent restaurant, you look at one restaurant, my restaurant in Ellington, I did the math on it and how many hours I have and so forth. The first week that this goes into effect at $10 an hour, my one store, the payroll will go up $2,600 a week, $2,600 a week. The first year it'll be up $138,000. Now this is just for tipped employees, right? So if the minimum wage goes up $1.55, if I got a guy I'm paying $10 an hour to wash dishes, $12 an hour to wash dishes. If I'm paying a guy that's been with me several years and he's learned new, new things, he's making 10, 12, I've got people at 16, $17 an hour. But if minimum wage is, goes up $1.55, don't you think they're gonna wanna raise? Absolutely, they're going to want to raise. So I'm not even taking the compression of, of people's rates in the back of the house that are already making more money. I am just taking uh, tipped employees with these numbers of $138,000. When it gets to $15 an hour, it's a graduated increase, a dollar a year up until 2026. The payroll just for tipped employees at my stores will be an increase $617,000. So we'll, we'll ask our servers, how many of y'all have worked, have y'all been working in the hospitality industry? How many of y'all have waited tables? Most of you. So if you have a guest check and you put it on the table and it's $100, how much are you gonna make? What, what do you make on a, on a tab? $100. Casey, you said you work in the, unmute yourself. And what do you make on a $100 tab at your restaurant that you work at? Um, you make 20 bucks. Yeah. 20 bucks. <laughs> um, right around 20 bucks, right? And where do you, Bo, where do you work? I work on Siesta Key at My Village Pub. Okay, so at My Village Pub, if there's a dollar, I mean, a hundred dollar tab, you make $20. What do you think the owner of My Village Pub made? On the hundred dollar tab? Yeah. I'm not sure. A third he, of that? He probably made seven, maybe 10 bucks. That's it. That's it. So there's the margin that restaurants work on. Seven, 10, 15% is a huge profit yeah. for a restaurant. 
15 is huge. Usually the margins restaurants work on are 10 or less. Okay. So you made 20 and the owner made 10, right? So if the owner has to pay more, if, if we're paying $617,000 more, there's only one thing we can do. Well, there's two things. Um, one, I can raise my prices to offset the 600,000 or I can close my doors. Obviously there's not $617,000 of profit in a restaurant currently, right? We just don't make that much money. You can look and see what your sales are and figure five to 10%. And you can figure out how much profit is on. I mean, a, a, a busy restaurant's doing 4 million, three to 4 million. So they're making maybe $300,000, maybe. That's, that's great profit in the restaurant industry. So if, if the cost of just labor goes up 600,000, he's losing 300,000 if he just raises his price, right? I mean, if he's making 300 right now and he's, his costs go up 600, he's gonna lose 300,000 next year. And I'm just using real rough numbers to make it easy. So he's gonna go out of business or he's gonna raise his prices. And if I raise my prices, obviously that's 20%, right? If I raise my price 20%, you're gonna lose a lot of guests. So there's several different angles I could do. What's 20%? That's what you've been making, right, Bo? 20%. So a lot of restaurants are thinking, well, we'll just go to a 20% service fee. So if I do 3 million and I put a 20% service fee on the check, then I've got my 600,000. I've covered my increase in payroll, but what else am I going to do? If, if I'm increasing at 20%, I'm probably going to cut out tipping, right? So instead of you making probably $30 an hour, I'm going to pay everybody $15 an hour, including the back of the house, front of the house. So what we're doing is we're cutting our server's hours, our income, which we do not want to do, right? I mean, I would break even. I could bring in the 600,000 and distribute it to all the staff so that they all made the, you know, the minimum wage, but they're not making what they used to make. And so what happens at that point? Let's just say that I've got 10 servers and five of them have been making $30 an hour and five of them have been making, you know, 15 to 20. The five that are at that level are going to be happy because now they don't have to work hard. They're guaranteed $15 an hour. And then you're going to distribute some of that excess. So you'll make 17, to $18 an hour. The people that have been making 30 are going to hate the new system. So what are they going to do? They're going to quit and go somewhere else. But if all the restaurants in Florida end up with this, it's just going to be horrible for the staff. So the other argument is, well, that's not really fair to the back of the house by saying we don't want to increase minimum wage because we don't want to pay the servers more. And it's not that we don't want to pay them $11.98 an hour. It's I don't want it to get to the point where I raise my prices and I lose my guests. Because in Florida, not everybody's, you know, they say all boats or an incoming tide lifts all boats. Well, not everybody in Florida is getting this increase. Look at all the retirees in Florida. They're not getting a pay raise because they're, they're not on a payroll anymore. So if I keep raising my menu, if I increase my menu 20%, my guests that eat with me three, four, five times a week may drop down to once or twice a week or once every other week. And so then what's going to happen? My price went up, but my guest count went down. My sales are going to go down. And what am I not going to need? As many hours for tipped employees. So it's a vicious, vicious spiral that we're doing our best to not let come into it. Um, we just, we, the restaurant industry has been, has been run very, very well in, in the whole country. And just increasing it with this way, it just to, to allow this is not going to be good. And it's happened before. It's happened in the big cities. It's happened in San Francisco. It's happened in Seattle. And there's the uh, server from Seattle that's made a video through Prager Institute that is phenomenal. And she talks about, you know, I was in the business. I've been in it for 30 years. I'm raising my son. I'm able to go to his baseball games. I'm able to do this. My schedule is awesome. I'm four days a week. Everything's great. I'm making good money. 
And then when the city of Seattle decided to increase the minimum wage to 15, she said, my hours were cut. I had to get two jobs. I didn't have the flexibility in scheduling. And so I couldn't attend every one of my son's ball games. I couldn't even afford to put him in every sport that he had been in the past. So there's just a lot of unintended consequences that, that we truly don't believe can be handled in one easy fix. And, and as I said, there, Publix is paying cashiers $15 an hour to start in Isla Mirada, right? Why do you do that? Again, supply and demand. They need people to work in Isla Mirada. It costs more to live there, so people need more, right? So do you think that Publix is paying that in Bradenton, Sarasota? Absolutely not, because it, you don't have to do that. It doesn't cost as much. And it's the same that the, the small towns in the panhandle in the center part of the state shouldn't be getting the same as Miami or even Anna Maria Island or Siesta Key, everything's different and everything, that's where the free market system. So you can't paint the entire state of Florida with a broad brush and the unintended consequences of just our industry. So obviously I know our industry better than I know agriculture, better than I know farming, better than I know uh, chemical mining or any of that phosphate mining. So if, if this could happen to just one industry that I'm aware of, how many other industries can be affected by this. But the biggest thing is Floridians in Florida is going to increase the price of everything because the cost to transport things will go up, the cost to build things, the cost to pack things will go up. And it, it does concern me with our elderly population. Um, they will be affected greatly, greatly. Um, I'm welcome for any, any questions. What's the good side of it? Oh, I, let me say this before I forget. I've had people not in our industry and some that are in there say, how can you tell the servers that you don't want to increase their wage? You're against this because you're afraid it'll cut their shifts when you know you do have some employees in the back of your house that are not making $15 an hour. So are, am I saying to them, I don't want to pay you $15 an hour. I want to keep your wages low. No, I'm not. Obviously, if they work with me a while, if they learn more stations in the back of the house, and they become a, you know, a cook that I can rely on, that I have few recooks that are to handle the pressure that can handle a thousand people a day uh, in sales. If, if I've got people like that, I'm currently already paying them 15, 17 plus dollars an hour. They're worth it. But what's it going to be when the 15 is the minimum wage? Can I afford to pay them 18, 22 dollars an hour? And again, as I said, if my sales drop, my sales Dollars may increase if I raise the price, but if my guest counts drop and I do less people a day, I don't need as many staff as I do. So their hours will get cut. And so, you know, they were talking about a guy making $15 an hour working 30 hours a week is $450 an hour. A guy getting 40 hours or 50 hours a week making $12 an hour is making more. So they're making more money. Yes, they're working more hours. But what the reality is, they're going to work 30, 20 to 5 to 30 hours a week, making more per hour, making less on their paycheck. And that's what really all matters is what's your paycheck at the end of the week? How much money did I make? Not how many hours I work, how many dollars did I make? So I, I don't have a problem standing in front of my staff and saying, I'm against raising the minimum wage. I don't feel like I'm trying to suppress their ability to make money. I'm trying to protect their jobs. Uh, I want them to have a job. I want them to have a 40 hour a, a week job that they get benefits, that they get health insurance, that they get vacations. That's, that's what's important to me is to have people. And I've, I've had people working with me for 20 years. We take care of our staff. We, they are family. We don't just treat them like family. They are family. That's not just a, you know, a slogan or a saying. We have people that work with us for long, long periods of time because we care about them. And so it's not just raising their, their minimum wage that will keep them there. You've got to take care of them. Um, it, it's so crucial. So it's the unintended consequences of amendment two that are so crucial in our industry. I can't imagine the others. Like I say, I haven't even looked 
deep into agriculture, into to mining. And a lot of people say, well, we don't pay anybody $15 an hour, so it's not going to affect me. And there are a lot of businesses that pay over $15 an hour, obviously. But if the price of everything goes up, it will affect everyone. And if people are like, I can't afford to, to buy lunch now, I can't afford to eat out, I can't afford, you know, the, the beer guy, John Saputo has said that a case of beer will go from 27 to $34 as soon as this passes. So it does affect everyone. I know I like to drink beer. So, you know, that right there will affect me. So I, I, am, I, I could talk for hours and hours. So please ask any questions you have, or if you have some already. Uh, I have I'll a question. I didn't see who asked. Yes, Debbie. Um, okay, so you said it would raise possibly like prices for restaurants, but couldn't this also raise like all around cost of living? Like eventually it could lead to, lead to housing and then it would just be, I feel like going in circles, eventually we'd have to raise the price minimum wage again and again. Well, and, and here's part of the problem too, Devin. Minimum wage is not meant as a head of the household income. Minimum wage is a starting wage. It's to get your foot in the door so that you can learn a trade. I mean, if, if you went to MTC and learned how to become a welder, right? You wouldn't be hired at minimum wage. So it's minimum wage is a starting and a training wage. That's what minimum wage was set up for. Now, granted, I understand there are people working minimum wage that are trying to earn a living. I, I do understand that. But the main idea, you know, they're like, well, the McDonald's, a lot of people, that's their career working at McDonald's. But McDonald's has offered management to people. But take McDonald's as a great example. How many of y'all been in McDonald's in the last, you know, whatever, six months? It's all kiosks now. There's nobody at the counter anymore. You order your own and you pay at the kiosk and you walk up and they put a bag in front of you or a tray in front of you. They have cut staff. So yes, everything will go up because the cost of transportation will go up. So it's not just restaurants. Food will go up at, at Publix. Everything will go up. But And that's why they said, you know, the incoming tide, everybody's going to get a raise. So is it just trading dollars? If now I, instead of $10 an hour, I make $15 an hour. And let's just say I'm staying at a 40 hour job, 40 hour a week job. So instead of making 400, now I make $600 a week, right? But if everything goes up the same amount, if everything I buy costs more, I'm just trading dollars. That additional $200 I made on my paycheck, less Uncle Sam's cut, is going to go to increase in, in um, rent, mortgage, home buying, everything will increase. And that's why I said, if, if you're a retiree, you're not getting that increase. So if you go to Publix and Publix goes up 20% and your budget is, at, you know, you know how much you've got coming in because you're on a fixed budget, you can't afford to do that. And so, A, you won't go out to dinner as much. You won't go to the movie. You won't go It'll be like COVID is still going on. You'll you'll be quarantined at home and not leaving because you can't afford to. Um, so yes, Kevin, everything will go up. It, everything will go up. Not just restaurant meals because labor will go up. And even like I say, even, even businesses that are already paying $15 an hour, if, if that's the wage they're getting now and minimum wage is 15, they're not going to still be paying someone $15 an hour. They're already paying $7 over minimum wage. They're going to continue paying that scale over minimum wage. Great question. Thank you. Dr. Penn, you look at the Thank you. Let's start with the class, uh, continue with the class. Thank you, Devin, for the question. Um, let's start with the class first on uh, questions or comments, uh, arguments. Uh, uh, information from John on uh, on this topic, and then Jihan, we can see if there are any questions from our distant audience on YouTube. And then uh, once that's done, uh, if we still have time, uh, John also has plenty of other things he can tell you. And in particular, John, I just hope you can update us a little bit on post-COVID uh, and where we are. And uh, interestingly enough, the day the day that the country shut down. That Tuesday, 
John was our, our first guest speaker in the COVID era. And he and I did that little show right from your restaurant there. And uh, yeah, that was what, how many months I have, I've stopped counting. It's a lot. I know. Well, it's it, March. It seems like, it seems like 20 months ago. It seems forever, but it was yeah. six months ago. It was six, six months ago. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start with the class here. Any of the rest of you have comments or questions for John? Yeah, I have a quick one. So Go do, ahead. You think, do you think the, uh, I, I, I'm just going to state my point. I'm, I'm, a, I'm against the minimum wage, wage increase because I'm thinking about it from a rational standpoint for my family's business. Um, but do you think that higher end restaurants like white tablecloth, fine dining restaurants would see this more? Because I know servers, there are usually getting paid above 15 starting and the meals are, I mean, I obviously cost the well per meal slightly, but the meals are already cost at, at a cost to a point where they're making profit since they are providing a more uh, more atmospheric dining experience. Nicole, could you um, say, what was the question though? What about those restaurants? Can, can they, they absorb it more? Oh, okay. Yeah. So yes, they can. And that's another reason, Cole, that you shouldn't paint a broad brush solution for this because some can, and obviously they pay more already they're paying more because they want, uh, you know, is it a higher quality staff member or they're bringing money? They've got larger margins. I mean, obviously if, if I'm charging $80 for a meal, uh, you know, as a white tablecloth and someone else is charging $20, there's $60 difference because there's not $60 in food cost increase, obviously. So their margin right there is already up. And more than likely their drinks are 20, 14 to $20 a piece. So they've got high, they've got a lot bigger margin than a full service restaurant versus a white tablecloth restaurant. So yeah, they could, have, they could which is why you shouldn't say everybody has to pay this amount. Um, if, if, and, and, you know, I mean, there's several awesome restaurants in that category that can absorb it. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, that, that they don't have a higher overhead than I do. So there's there's different costs everywhere. I mean, a white tablecloth that has, you know, I mean, they've got linen costs that I don't have. They've got a lot of others. They could have a higher um, occupancy cost where they're paying a higher rent than I am at, at one of my locations. So, you know, if someone has a beach front restaurant, they're paying more. If someone has something in a bad neighborhood, but it's the best food and they're busy as heck all the time because you've got to eat at this restaurant, they're at a, a you know, a, they've got a different price structure as everybody has a different price structure. So you pay people what you, you feel that they're bringing to you. And that's one of the things they say, it's, it's all negotiable. You know, if, if you walk into a restaurant and they say, I'll, I'll pay you five, 54 an hour, you don't have to take the job. You can go to a white tablecloth restaurant that is gonna pay you $10 an hour, correct? So it's all, you know, it's all the free market and that's who should establish what you're paying. Okay, thank you, Cole, John. Uh, other questions from the students here? Sam, anything? I have a quick question. If this were to go into effect, how is this Akilia? Soon, yes. Oh, okay. I, how soon will it go into effect? So Akilia, if this passes, the new rates would go into effect. I believe it's either September 1st or September 30th of 2021. And so then every year on that anniversary, they would increase a dollar. And then at the end, when it gets to $15 an hour, which I believe is September of 26 then it goes back to the way it is now where there's a cost of living increase every year. Um, we currently have that. So every, I believe it's November 1st, they look at what, and, and there's an indicator indices that they use. And so it's been around 2%, 3% uh, increase to the minimum wage every year. Florida, we put that in on a constitutional amendment once before. So we're already taking that into consideration. But one of the big things, and so it will go up every September until it becomes 15, and then that cost of living adjustment will take effect. The, the difference is, and you've got to look, I mean, 3% of 856 versus 3% of $15. Obviously, you're doubling the increase every year once it gets to 15. 
because, well, it's not quite double. 856 and 15 are not half and double, but so you're doing 3% of a, a larger number. Your increase is going to be more every year as well. So that's just going to continue to escalate the minimum wage. But it goes into effect next September. And like I say, I don't hold me to first or the 30th. Um, it goes, I believe it's with the state fiscal year. So I think it's September 30th, but again. Yeah, I think their fiscal year starts October 1st. I believe so. Thank you, Achilles. Sam, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question. So how will, if, if the bill were, were to be passed and they will increase the minimum wage, uh, how will it um, affect, would it affect career, de career development uh, such as like, since now everyone is getting the same amount without any, like, like you could work harder and get more tips than someone that wouldn't get tips. Now they're all getting the same amount. Would, would it affect? Yeah. Yeah. Sam, that's something that I believe every restaurant will have to decide for themselves. I mean, do you just blanket everyone at the same rate or do you, you know, increase and cut the number of people? Um, we've, we've already worked. I mean, when COVID occurred, we had been talking about changing our point of sale so that we have handhelds. So the staff have handhelds now that you can do more contactless payments and, and so forth. Um, but Instead of servers at our restaurant, they have three, four tables max. You know, we won't let them have more than 16 people to wait on at any time. Will I go to 20 people? Will I go to five tables with a handheld? Will, you know, so that's where the automation comes in. I'm not going to put iPads on every table like they do at a lot of airports now where you order and pay and, you know, make sure you tip yourself because you did all the work. Um, but automation will help go from four tables to five. So obviously I can cut two to three shifts a day at lunch and two to three at dinner, which is going to affect. Um, I think I got deviated from, so some restaurants will, will do that. Some will cut out tipping completely. And so you don't take the $3 and two cent tip credit. So if I do that, then I can share tips with everyone. Currently you can only do tip share with people that come into contact with the guests. So I can take that 20% service fee and I can use that for anybody for payroll. So I can say, well, Sam, you've worked with me for five years. So I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. Achilia just started. I'm going to pay her the minimum wage of $15 an hour. And Devin, she is a horrible server. So I'm only going to pay her 15. Bo has been with me for, you know, two years or, I mean, he's been with me two weeks and he's already as good as, you know, so it, then it's all subjective because you can pay people whatever you want, as long as you're paying them at least $15 an hour. Um, so I won't take the tip credit and I can just distribute money any way I want to. Um, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's equal, you know, that's, so we're all the same, but where's the incentive for Sam to be a great server to upsell to be a smile on his face every day and just be happy and, and make his guests happy and, and have the highest sales and the highest cover average and make more money than Devin, who, you know, is just comes in and punches the clock and she's like, well, I'm going to make $15 and that's good enough for me. So why, why should I work harder? Why should I sell more? Why should I make my guests happy? They have to tip me 15 or, you know, the service charge is already there. So you're, you're basically changing the entire uh, industry. To, to make everybody the same. And that's not the way we are. That's not the way our country is. That's not the way our industry is. Our industry is about making people happy. You know, I, I, I quote Arthur from the, uh, the movie, Arthur is, you know, he's drunk as he can be in a restaurant. He's like, aren't waiters great? You ask them for things and they bring them. <laughs> and that's the most simplistic definition of our industry it is. But that's what people do. They come into our restaurants and our hotels and all they want to do is ask you for things and they want you to bring them to them. It's, you know, I'd like, I'd like a margarita, not a problem. Be right there. You know, would you like a, you know, a Patron? So, I mean, that's what we do. And we don't want to take that incentive away from people where it's like, yeah, what do they have? All right, good. You know, no, no sale, no salesmanship, no sportsmanship, no nothing. 
Uh, that's that's what separates us. That's what separates restaurants from restaurants. And if every restaurant has to pay the same and act the same, you're just going to have a lot of robots, and it won't be fun. And Thank you, Sam. It's all other, about fun. Other other questions from the from the class? Anybody else have any comments or questions? No. I'm just curious. Once again, John asked you this earlier, but how many of you are ha, are or have been servers? Just raise your hand so I can see. Are or have been servers? Okay, Casey. Oh, and Devin. Okay, Casey. Uh, where 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 ha have you been, or where are I can't remember. I I do remember actually, but tell the class. Lock and Key Restaurant down in Inglewood. Yeah, and uh, so Casey, what what are your thoughts as you hear John Horn talk? Um, I. Just, I don't know. I don't think that raising the minimum wage to $15 would uh, benefit, you know, me personally as a server or anybody else, um, you know, in our industry. I definitely don't agree with it. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. And then we already- Has your, has your, um, has it been discussed in your restaurant, Casey? Um, I'm currently not working because of COVID. So I'm not COVID. sure if it's discussed that or not. <laughs> And Bo, how about in your restaurant on Siesta Key? Has it have have you had any shift meeting conversations or anything? I'm honestly kind of surprised because no, it hasn't. I remember you talking about this in Adam Carmer's class last year or last semester. So I remember hearing about it. Um, but no, it wasn't discussed. I'm not a huge personally a huge fan of it because you know, as a someone who works in the service industry and is getting a degree in hospitality, it's scary to think that. You know, obviously bartending and serving is not a career. It's not really the career path that I want, but it's a good start. And it gets like, teaches you a lot of um, important skills, how to talk to people and whatnot. And it pays decent money. No one really counts on the, the, the wages you get from the restaurant. Obviously all the money comes from the tips, but I feel like with the $15 an hour, if, if you took away tipping, and instead, the restaurant paid you maybe based on what your sales were. If like you were better in sales, you got a better pay. Um, it would obviously decrease the generosity of people. If people come in, they leave you a really big tip. You're not, you're no longer going to get that big tip. You're not going to get uh, that feeling of uh, appreciation when you, you know, when a guest really appreciates you and they want to compensate you for that. You'll no longer be able to get that $50 tip that was just out of the kindness of their heart because it's going to go to the restaurant and, you know, they don't have to give that to you anymore. So it's, I personally don't like the $15 an hour increase. So thank you. And, I think you're also going to see Bo is if, I mean, we, we hear a lot of times, you know, Bo's great, pay him more. And I, I think because there's a conception that, Servers don't make good money uh, from the from the restaurant. They make the money in tips. And so if they start making minimum wage or they start making a higher wage, if they start making $12, $15 an hour, even if you still allow tips, which like Seattle allowed tips and most of them raised the money, but tips started diminishing drastically. So because people will start, just as you said, Bo, people will think, well, they're already making great money. Uh, you know, we've taken care of that by ballot issue too. And so now they're making money. I don't need to tip A as much or at all. And so it's, it's will change the income for sure. And that's, you know, right now it's been set up and I think it's been this way since the old West and, you know, the saloons, but if someone does a good job, you, you tip them and you tip them well, you know, and that's to make sure you get good service. That's, hey, see, that's the way I, it's been set up. Casey, I owe you an apology. Uh, of course, I, I know your situation. Casey's also in the internship. It's class. okay. Don't I, worry about it. <laughs> I forgot Casey, right? I didn't mean to put you on the spot with that. It's okay. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. And Devin, uh, are you still working as a server right now? Or where did you work when you did? Well, not like a server in a restaurant, but I work for Chick-fil-A and I have helped serve for my dad's business and stuff. So I have both experiences. And you know, my dad owns businesses, so I understand from that standpoint, not wanting to raise it to 15, and as someone who works, 
has worked from minimum wage up to where I'm at now, you know, I, if I were working at $15 an hour, again, you know, I wouldn't have the incentive to work harder, but also I liked the feeling of accomplishment I personally got being able to raise myself up and then being like, hey, you've worked hard. We want to reward you with a raise. That's a personal, like, feeling of self-accomplishment. And I like that feeling. Yeah. So that's another thing I love. Think there's no point in raising it to 15. Thank you. Dana. One thing we used to do um, back when minimum wage, and it wasn't too many years ago, um, the tipped wage was 213 an hour, and it was that way for years and years. But we would pay some of our servers three and four, five dollars an hour, which was three dollars more than minimum wage, just because a they were trainers or they were just excellent service because you could acknowledge someone doing a better job than someone that just started. And as the minimum wage started increasing, we stopped doing that because you couldn't just keep, you know, paying more when you're paying everybody the same amount. So you, you, yeah, you lose the ability to say, Sid, you're an awesome server. I'm going to pay you more than I'm paying, you know, people that just start because and you see things, you pick people, things off the floor, you greet everybody that walks by, you're just always in a great mood. You're, you're better than, you know, just someone that's just starting. And you can't do that as, as you get to that. And so you've got to find different ways to say attaboy. And that's, that's not the way, you know, attaboys are great, but monetary is good too. It, it truly is in establishing yourself higher. It's a great observation, John. Before we open it up, Jihan, to questions, uh, from the, from the rest of the audience, I just want to make two comments. I can argue this both ways, and that's what professors do, and professors who are also hospitality professionals. And so I could argue about uh, uh, rising tide floats all boats. I mean, I get it. But I could also argue what Danny Meyer just did in New York. So two years ago, John, maybe it was three, he started this grand experiment. What was it four years ago? Four years. And it's hard to believe, but yeah. Yeah, it is. And he uh, he did just what John was talking about. So there was no tipping allowed in any of the restaurants. And he has seven or eight. They're different kind. They're all full service, but except for his Shake Shack. And he uh, he eliminated it. And I went and ate in one of his older restaurants just to see what it was like. And I talked to those servers. You know what? They weren't thrilled. And you know what, John? You, you were right. They started becoming, I don't know what the right word is, lethargic, maybe in the service. They weren't particularly excited. Yeah. And uh, uh, and they said to me, well, you know, we, we, we don't, they're not going to bad mouth him, but we, we think really we ought to look at going back. I said, what about the people in the back of the house? They said, well, he was paying them enough before anyway. So it didn't matter that much. And most of us tipped them out a little bit too. So, uh, and, and helped them. So there are sides to this argument. And with that, Jihan, uh, do you have any anybody that has a question from the audience? Yes. And just on that, Pat, Danny Meyer went back on. They went back now. Yeah. He, yeah, he's back to tipping because what happens? The server, the good servers, went somewhere else that still used the old method of, you know, getting tips for good jobs, and the ter yeah. the servers that obviously their hourly rate dropped. They went somewhere else because right. that's what I was saying. It's what you like you're saying to show. So people want to show. They want they want that person who's devoted to them. And I worked for many years in the summers in Switzerland. In Switzerland, there, uh, you know, the price you see on the menu is what you pay. There's the taxes included in the price, the tips included in the price. Right. And uh, you can leave a, a little bit if you want to, but it's never more than a percent or so. In yeah. fact, the word for it in French is le pouvoir. It's for to have a drink. And that's that's what it's for. But the but the but the flip side of that for the guest was you want to have ketchup with your steak? No, we don't do ketchup with steak. It's not done. Whereas if you ask Bo for ketchup with a filet mignon, my guess is Bo would be sprinting to get the ketchup for you. And, uh, uh, the question, Dr. Pat, from the audience. He's going to be cringing. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually about this. Yeah, it's interesting because the viewer has asked this question to, to John, uh, said that in most parts of Europe and Asia, 
do restaurants have a no tipping policy? In other words, the tipping is included into the price of the meal. Did National Restaurant Association think about a policy where there is no tipping allowed, but that it is part of the, so in other words, I guess what he's, uh, this person is trying to say, mm -hmm. yes, let's increase the minimum wage, but get rid of the tipping so that you put that inside as a service fee and everybody, you know, the, the, the guests uh, pay that, but all servers or employees um, get paid the same. What is your thought about that, John? You know, I'm sure that, you know, in Europe and Asia, it is true that you don't really are expected to pay tip. It's it's part of the meal that price that you're paying. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I could just about guarantee the, the NRA, the National Restaurant Association has not looked into that at all, you know, to make that a policy. But that is one of the potentials of this amendment is that everyone will get rid of tipping. And I mean, I've traveled in Europe and extensively, I, I love going over there, but I, I, that's just not the way American hospitality is set up. Um, have I gotten great service in Europe? Absolutely. And, you know, and I've left tip because all Americans tip when they go over there, because you never know, is it included? Is the GST part of this or you don't know, so you do. Um, but, but I don't, I mean, that's just not the way we're set up in America. And fortunately, you know, our forefathers didn't bring that with them when they came. And so we, we establish a different form when we establish it. It's, you know, is it motivational for them over there? If they're making X dollar and that's all they're making, just like we were saying, uh, I, I think you become a bit lethargic and you're just going through the motions. There's no incentive to take care of people better you know, do we have the ethic that, well, it doesn't matter if I make $5 or $55, I'm going to treat them the same. Some people do, some people don't. Um, I just don't like it. I, I, I like incentive. I like tips. I like to, to, I like people earning it. I, I earn my pay every day. Um, and I think that's what, you know, we should do. If, if I hire a contractor and they don't perform for me to, when I'm working my restaurant, I don't hire them again or I badmouth them or, and I do my best so that they don't get that way. And that's the only thing you've got because you can't say, well, I'm going to go in there and I'm not going to tip Casey as much as I did last because she didn't bring me my water when I asked for it. She didn't bring me this, blah, blah, blah. So I don't have that control over what I've tipped to that person. All I can do is when I go in the restaurant say, is Devin working tonight? Because I don't want Casey taking care of my table. You know, so that's the only control you have over it. You can't control it with tips. And not that, you know, I'm going to go in and say, oh, I want Casey because she's a horrible server and I can leave her a 10% tip tonight and save money. That's, <laughs> that's not what we do either. I'm not going someone somewhere for bad service. And that's the other thing. You know, no one walks into a restaurant and say, oh, I'm going there because Casey is horrible. You've got to go in and ask for Casey. She won't bring you your ketchup. She won't bring you this. She'll forget everything. That's not what we do. We go to some place that's going to take care of us and, and we're going to have a great time, right? So that's the only way we have. If there's no tips involved, that's the only control you have is going somewhere else. Gian, anything else from the audience? No, no, Dr. Fett, that's okay. it. Thank you. John, this is great. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I would like to, uh, we have 16 minutes left. I would like to uh, segue sure. into the other part of the discussion which is what the heck have you been doing since uh, COVID started and how have you dealt with it and where are we heading? By the way, John was a big speaker for us this year on a, on a several panels. He's, he's like the guru. Yeah, COVID has taken its toll. I mean, it, it has gotten everybody nervous. It's, um, you know, it's brought in politics to restaurants. We, when we opened back up, and we opened up a week after the governor said we could open up. We weren't quite comfortable opening up when, when they first allowed it. Um, we wanted to make sure that our guests were ready to come back to restaurants because every business, not just our hospitality, every business is built on customer confidence. And so if, we, if you open back up and people are nervous about coming in and they don't see proper cleaning, they don't see the way you're handling sanitation and everything, you're going to lose people and you could possibly lose them forever. And so we took an extra week. We worked on, again, I told you, we, we were 
changed out or went to a different point of sale. And just like everybody knows, no one likes change, right? I'd been with Aloha for forever, forever, as long as I can remember, 25 years. We changed to Toast, a brand new cloud-based point of sale, but it has handhelds and it has the KDS in the kitchen. We, we did that so that we could uh, handle our guests more sanitarily, less contact as much as we could. And we started slowly, you know, we were 25% occupancy in the restaurants. Uh, the governor was awesome about you. We're in Florida, dining outside. You can have as many tables outside as long as they're six foot socially distanced. So we, we opened up and we were doing 30% of the prior year sales. It gradually increased, increased. We went to 50%. Everybody started feeling good about being out again. We had a lot of people that would not walk in the restaurants. They would eat outside on the patios or under tents or whatever. I mean, we set up outdoor dining in the parking lots, in the yards, anywhere we possibly could set up to. Our, our sales went up to 70, 75, 80%. And obviously a lot of that was outside. Everybody was feeling good. And that's when we got the first spike in, in COVID tests and the positive tests. And so the governor backed down, he closed the bars again. So he just left the restaurants open, left them at 50%. And we saw our sales drop below 50%. And why is that? Because people didn't have the confidence of going out. They were nervous about being around people. And it's understandable. When you see COVID uh, positive spiking, you don't want to be around people. So, but when we had opened back up, we, we put all of our staff in masks. We hired, or we didn't hire, we adjusted job descriptions. So instead of a busser, we had a guy with a reflective shirt on and all this guy or girl did their entire shift at lunch or dinner was wipe high access. I mean, the front door, they would wipe the front door down. We had our host, we would block the door open so you didn't have to touch the front door. We had entrances and exits. We had them going out a side door so we didn't have bottlenecks at the, at the entry. Um, we had them just walking around. We did PCs, you know, salt, pepper, all the condiments were all PCs. Uh, we had them and if someone wanted to use a salt shaker or a ketchup bottle, they could. And then this safety patrol guy wiped everything down in between each guest and we put it in a sanitized area. So, I mean, we went above and beyond what we needed to do. Um, we're currently, this past week, we were at 85 and 90% of what we did the prior year. Um, so it has gradually built back up. You know, it lingered around 70% for the longest time, 80. We're in the high 90s right now. Part of that's because Labor Day, so, and it was a different week last year versus, uh, you know, we're just off by one week with the way it fell this year, as late as it could on the 7th. Um, so we had, we're getting great and we, we're feeling better with the COVID testing coming down. So we do feel that, that the restaurants are returning, but our labor is still a lot higher than it was last year, same time. So the sales are almost the same, but our labor is higher. Why? Because, you know, we've got the cleaning people on, we've got extra hosts there to hold the doors open to make sure that there's less contact. Um, we're doing a lot more to go business. We, we, redesigned two of our kitchens to do to go business completely different. Um, before we were about 3% to go business, we're over 12% across the board in, in to go business. That's a huge swing for any restaurant, but for us. So, you know, you have to find out what food travels well, what food doesn't travel well. And so you try to come up with a special menu that will travel. Uh, we're doing all the curbside uh, takeaway. We're doing a lot of things in that nature as well. John, so COVID is coming back. I mean, the, the business of fluctuating with COVID. Um, just one second, Pat, unless it's, uh, here's- No, here's, no, go ahead. So, so with this minimum wage, we, we put buttons on our servers as a test market because we wanted to educate our guests. With the Restaurant and Lodging Association, we're not able, nobody has money right now. Restaurants have been devastated. Hotels have been devastated through COVID. So we've been trying to raise money to fight this minimum wage fight, right? So what have we done? We've decided we're gonna do a grassroots where we're gonna bring people to, you know, bring the information to, this, to, the, to educate the voters just like we're doing today, but we're doing it in our restaurants too. So the servers are wearing buttons 
and they're talking to their guests and say, you know, ask me how amendment two, you know, ask me about amendment two, and they'll just hand them this. It's a easy little uh, placard. And so what I've said to them is the last thing you want to do in a restaurant or, you know, what do they say about the dining table? You know, you don't just discuss religion, politics, or sex, right? So right now we're, we're discussing politics like nobody's business. And I've told my staff, I said, the last thing I want you to do, we're already fighting political fights with the masks, right? Because people will come in and we're requiring our guests to wear masks now. And so people are, you know, make, putting a political spin on that. And now we want to talk about Amendment 2. So I don't want to put my staff in a bad situation because they're working for tips. So, you know, if someone's against us, so what we've done is just say, ask me about it. It's very subliminal. So that's what we're doing as, as underhand as we can. So that's part of our transition during COVID and with Amendment 2 at the same time. I'm sorry, Pat, I didn't. No, it's just I'm like, I can't remember what I was talking about. You were talking that. about what post post COVID opening was and then reopening after the spike. Yeah. Reestablishing after the spike. Uh, um, a couple of quick questions, John. One is uh, on the staffing. Are you are the same? Uh, are the servers both delivering food and bussing tables the same person? Yeah. Or do you have, so you have different yeah. people doing that. Then? We have different people. So no cross contamination. Yeah, there's no cross contamination. And the other thing we do is every 30 minutes, we ring a bell. I mean, cause you know, you're trying to, there's a lot of things going on and you're trying to do things, but we're trying to make it fun too. Again, I think a restaurant should be fun no matter how horrible times are. So we've got a bell and they'll ring a bell every 30 minutes. So the host or the bartender, which wherever the bell is, they've got a timer going off every 30 minutes, their alarm goes off, they ring the bell and everybody just stops what they're doing. And they run to a hand sink and wash their hands. And they all sing uh, Cheeseburger in Paradise because instead of, you know, they always say, you should sing happy birthday to you. And if you do that, then that's the proper amount of time to wash your hands, but that's boring. It's happy birthday, you know, who wants to sing that? So we all have them all sing Cheeseburger in Paradise. So they're all like, I like mine with lettuce and tomato. And so, you know, the whole crew is just having, you just got to make it fun. So just things like that do make it different. Um, so it's not as, oh God, I got to go wash my hands. So, but the servers deliver the meals and they've got gloves on when they deliver the meals, or I have a food runner deliver the meals, but they never take contaminated right. Right. from the table without washing their hands immediately after. And they're not, the servers are not removing. What, what about the and bar? And you've seen restaurants do all kinds of things. The restaurant, there's restaurants that will put a large oval on the end of the table and have their guests, um, fill the oval and then they take them away. So they're not reaching over someone. They're not reaching past someone. Think about a booth with four people. You've yeah. got to reach right by someone to get to the next person. So they're asking them, will you put all the food at the end of the table? And again, you know, if you're a server, you hate doing that, but it's part, it's part of the times and this will go away hopefully sooner than later. Hopefully. What about the bars, John? How are your bars? Doing? So, I have just reopened two of my bars. I closed them down when the when the governor shut down bars. I closed my bars down, and I did it mostly for my 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 bartenders because I didn't want them to become police. Because what happens when you go to a bar? I know what happens when I go to a bar. I get lovey dovey. I get close to people. Like you know your inhibitions, and you just start talking closer and closer. And it's just human nature. I mean that's why you're there. You want to be social. You want to have all your buds, you want to meet new buds. And so I have just recently, the one right behind me here is the one at our 41 location, right down from the college. We've taken almost all the chairs. We've just put them back, but we've got like two chairs and then six feet, two chairs and then six feet. And then we don't seat the table right behind them so that we can keep the social distancing. Uh, but we just started that last week. So from the time the governor closed the bars back down, we did not seat at our bars. Um, and that, you know, that takes a hit in your volume because we have a lot of regulars that come in every day, sit at the bar, they may have an app, but they're going to have a couple of drinks with their friends that they meet from the neighborhood every day. Um, and so, you know, we, yeah, well, we, we missed out on a lot of that. Those of us who are coming in once or twice a week to patronize your bar have not been doing it, but so. Uh... <laughs> exactly. And, and I love to sit at a bar and have lunch. I mean, I would rather sit at a bar right. than sit at a table because right. I just like the social atmosphere. Right. But we just, I didn't want my staff, I didn't want my bartenders to have to play social distance police. 
you know, because all you're doing is upsetting your guests and then they're mad at the bartender right. for making you do what you should do. But it's, it's hard. I mean, we're all that way when we're socially drinking. <laughs> yeah. So any, any other questions from the class? Anybody have anything that you want to ask? John, now's a good time. And how about our guests, Mari or Jihan, anybody have anything? No? I just want to say, Dr. To to say that, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mari. I was just going to say that I, uh, before this, was an uninformed uh, voter. And so I am definitely going to vote no for the $15 uh, minimum wage Thank you. For yeah. that. Jihan, what were you going to say? Uh, John, I just want to tell you that we have done a um, US wide research for three uh, consecutive months. It's travel confidence index for all US travelers. Part of that, we asked them about traveling with airplane, uh, also staying in a hotel and eating in a restaurant. One of the item that is the least confident that Americans are is the public spaces. And so they want to see it. Uh, the, you know, like I said, I've dined in your restaurant just recently. The fact that people are actively cleaning the, 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 the doors, the general public areas uh, is really very good. And the research shows that people need to see that more often. In the past, you always did it, but you didn't really show to people. Right. But now they want to see it. And, and I, I applaud you for that one as well, too. I just want to just make that note. Well, and, and we did the QR codes for menus and QR code for payment, you know, so that you could see the menu without, you know, you could see it on your iPhone or your device or whatever you had that you can get the menu that way because you want to do as, again, as much contactless as you possibly can. But we brought our menus back, our regular menus. But again, that's what the safety guy does all day. He's wiping the menus in between each guest. So we've got you know, soiled and sanitized or, you know, sections of everything, condiments, menus, and we do not use them in between. And, and I've got the guy doing that, like you say, Gian, right in the middle of the dining room, because you, you want the people to realize that you are doing it, you know, used to, they, they do it in the back or they do it here, but you want people to see it. It's all about the consumer confidence. That's a great observation. Listen, I want everybody to unmute themselves. Everybody unmute. Even if you have a dog barking, it's okay or your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or mother or dad hollering at you. So, so, okay, unmute and everybody give John a big hand. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you, you inviting me. I appreciate you letting me tell you our side of the story. And, and there are two sides. There definitely are. Um, of course. Everybody should make a livable wage. There, there's no one, I don't think anyone will ever say that, that there shouldn't be a livable wage, but we have to make it so that there's also training wages, there's also youth wages, there's also entry wages. Um, I, I guarantee you, I started as a bus boy <clears throat> a few years ago, and, and I was making 201 an hour. I was not worth $15 an hour, and very few people are on their first job. So, but I, I started that, that was my entry into the restaurant business. I mean, I'd worked Wendy's before and I'd done that, but I had never been in a full service restaurant. And I started as a bus boy, became a server, became an assistant to the assistant's assistant manager, I believe is where I, I was after I got my college degree. And now I own four restaurants and I have over 300 people working with me. And that's the way it's set up to do. That's what minimum wage is for, is to get you in the door. Once you're in the door, then your ability, your, your fun, your you know, your work ethic will get you as far as you want. And so that's why we need to keep our, our starting wage where we can all afford. I, I just don't want to lose my guests. I don't want to cut hours for my staff. And, and, and I just don't want to cut, I don't, I, I just don't want to see them working harder than they are right now. I want them to continue working the way they are. I mean, I've got people that have been with me for 13, 15 years, still waiting tables or bartending. They've got, you know, a wife and two kids. They've got two rental properties. They've got a most gorgeous house on the lake, all from waiting tables. And, you know, there's not many places and in industries that you can do that. So it's, it's a good industry and I, I don't want it to change. That's why you guys have all chosen hospitality. Um, so it's awesome. 
Thank you for joining us today, John. It's been it's been a good open discussion, and uh, and I think given everybody a lot to think about. Uh, guys, uh, John will join us again. I hope he usually does uh, for the board panel, which I think is October fourteenth. It's that Tuesday. It's on the syllabus. And, uh, and I'm sure that topic will come up that day. I, I have no doubt that he will have Elliot bring that topic up that day, I'm sure. And, uh, and so we can have a more open discussion on this. Uh, next Appreciate week's all guest, the questions. It's always helpful, for sure. It is, it is. Next week's guest is Dr. Peter Yesowich from MMGY. Formerly, he was Y Partnerships in Orlando. They're specialists in hospitality uh, marketing and research, uh, not, not, not esoteric research. This is like uh, buying and customer research. So Peter will have a great presentation. He'll be zooming in. And uh, so enjoy your research on Peter and uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about what you find before that 